Good morning. You may notice that this mic is not amplifying my voice. But it, it, it looks good, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks very professional. Uh, we're, we're videotaping this as we do for every edge in education uh, to ensure that other community members have an opportunity to see these great conversations in, about the future of education in the world and the future of education uh, at ISP as well. And uh, usually when we begin these talks, I show you the mission of the school. But uh, to abbreviate, I mean, there won't be a test about what the mission is, but to abbreviate the mission, we talk about inspiring, engaging, and empowering learners. And I think that does encapsulate what we're striving to do at ISP. And frankly, it's a tall order, but I think it's a noble, uh, a, a noble direction and standard for the school because that's what we want for our kids as they move into the world we live in now and the world in the future. And the challenges for educators are becoming greater and greater, as I'm sure we all know, and for parents, because parents are very much educators as well. We know well that what happens at home usually has greater impact than what we do at school, but we think we can help. And part of the way we can help is by working with parents, not just kids, even though they're our core business, they're our, our core focus, it has to be an entire community effort, and that's one of the reasons why we do the Edge in Education. And we're really happy today to have our three presenters who are, are seminal in their area of work uh, and very much connected to the work we're doing, especially this week, around accreditation. So ISP is accredited by the Council of International Schools and the New England uh, Association of Schools and Colleges, and we've been doing a preliminary visit with both of these organizations over the past week. Uh, it's been uh, an engaging process for all of our, not all, but representatives of all of our community members, and uh, it's been very thought-provoking for us as well. And the reason that's the case is that this round of accreditation is not the same old, same old. It's uh, really an attempt to help motivate and propel schools into the 21st century and not just be a, uh, a repetition of what schools have looked like when you and I went to school. And that's what's needed for kids. So we're excited to be partnering uh, with these organizations. We're also excited to be the first, I think I can say this, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the first international school in the world to be doing the NEASC protocols uh, as well as this uh, synchronized process. And we're proud to, uh, to be the school doing this because that means that we have a part in shaping this process. And we, it's really a conversation. It's not a one-way street. So that's my quick introduction. And I'd like to briefly introduce our three speakers, uh, uh, starting with the last to first, I think. So Peter, you're, you're up last, right? This is Peter Mott. And he's a former head of the Zurich International School for many years and is now the director of the Commission on International Education, which is part of New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Peter. <laughs> Greg Curtis. Greg has been an international educator for many years. I think more than 20 years. He's been a teacher, a tech director, a facilitator, a professional development leader, and now he's uh, an independent consultant and facilitator, and also an author. And um, name of your last book? Uh, Leading Modern Learning. Leading Modern Learning. And so that'll be Greg, and then after Greg, and actually, <laughs> sorry. Leading us off, I should say, is uh, someone I've known for many years, Kevin Bartlett. Kevin is the former head of the International School of Brussels and is uh, now uh, the co-founder of uh, two organizations. One is the uh, Next Frontier Inclusion and the other is the Common Ground Collaborative. And so I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Bartlett. <laughs> Thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, just a quick word before I start. Uh, to congratulate the school on this kind of event. Um, I'm doing a lot of work in schools around the world. Very few engaged parents in this learning conversation. But we're all, we see ourselves as learning stakeholders, the kids, the teachers, the leaders, 
the admin staff and parents, but it's, it's seldom that we actually engage all learning stakeholders in this conversation. So just a word of congratulations to Arnie and ISP for having this tradition. Um, so I'm going to keep this as brief and active as possible. Um, you've heard a bit about us, um, so you know who we are to some degree, but why are we here? Um, here on purpose, so in both senses, not accidentally, but this was actually booked, you know, we flew in deliberately. Um, <laughs> but also uh, here on a particular purpose, which is to improve schools by looking at impact on the learning of the kids of the actions we take and keeping it as simple as possible and as systemic as possible and involving as many people as possible. That's kind of what drives the three of us in all the work we do around the world, in our, wearing our different hats. Um, but also here on principle. I've been in the learning business for about 40 years. A lot of that has resulted in some very late, unfortunately, late career aha moments. After many, many years of school leadership, I now begin to realize what I might have been doing to be more effective. Um, and this is one of the biggest ahas. As leaders, you look for patterns. You're always looking for patterns in how things work. We're always trying to make sense of what we do. Because schools, officially, by the way, officially schools and hospitals are the two most complicated organizations in the world. For kind of obvious reasons, because they're very people intensive and they both deal with saving lives or making lives. And that's a complex business. Um, so we need greater simplicity. And one of the places to look for simplicity is in a few guiding principles. This, this is Margaret Wheatley's work. She wrote a beautiful, elegant book where she applied the principles of chaos theory and quantum physics to organizations. And she found that the, the really fine organizations were driven by a few guiding principles within which there was lots of personal freedom and not constantly being harried by multiple uh, rules and regulations. And that's just a mantra for me, is uh, keep it simple, work from principles, not rules. Sure, you need some rules to keep the kids safe, but fundamentally, the work we're doing is about powerful principles that guide everything we do, that everybody understands, that makes sense to everybody, and not multiple rules and regulations. Um, a friend of mine, when I was just doing this in Kenya, after a minute's thought, said, yeah, when I come to think about it, I wouldn't mind breaking a rule uh, but I'd feel really bad breaking a principle. So prin principles are truths, that we, things we hold to be true that we all kind of stick to. But where do we get them from? Um, Arnie may have shared with this, this with you at some point, but I'll share a trick for those of you who are parents who are now sort of in the educational conversation. Next time you're in an educational cocktail party, if you want to sound smart, you begin every sentence with, research tells us... <laughs> and my own experience bears this out. After that, you can say anything, it's going to sound intelligent. Um, but actually, these principles that we work to come from both research and experience. But we're going to start with experience. Um, here's my hunch, more than a hunch, because I've done this all over the world. Every one of us in the room, it would be the same if we had kids in the room, whatever our other experiences, we've all had experiences with learning, and we've all got learning stories to tell. So I'm going to ask you to share, each of you, a learning story. Because you might not have done that before, I'll model it for you. So I went to a small rural primary school, and I was pretty successful. Uh, was, I, think, I think I was the only kid in the class, so that helped. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then I went to this kind of pre-Hogwarts, uh, all-boys, uniform secondary school in a big old building in a remote and bleak part of the north of England. Uh, and I just would like to stop for a moment. Sympathy there. Um, <laughs> and um, I did okay up to the age of 16 because basically I thought the teachers liked me. And if you read the research, the relationship between teachers and kids is vital. So I thought I could do what we called at the time A-level history, the kind of equivalent of IB history. I handed in my first essay. And the method of assessment and feedback was the teacher, I still remember him, with with deep visceral hatred, actually, um, <laughs> was sitting out the front in his black gown and black mortarboard, and we were all there in our... Uh, everything had to be black, I don't know why. So he, he got to my essay in the history pile, first essay I'd ever handed in, and he said, in front of the whole class, Bartlett, I believe you may have reached your intellectual ceiling. <laughs> so um, what he basically said was, you can't do A-level history. So I, I, I followed his advice, I failed A-level history, I stopped trying. I stopped trying because, well, the teacher told me I'm too dumb to do it. 
So now I don't want to preempt your own stories by giving you just a negative one. Some of your stories will be inspirational, will be about a great mentor, a wonderful thing that happened to you. But what I'd like you to try to do is think yourself back to a moment when something happened to you that shaped the way you think about yourself as a learner that has such a powerful impact that you, could, that you can still recall it sitting here in Prague today, this morning. So have a think, and then on your old technology, on your table, there's a, there's a page on the table, it says, draw your learning story. So instead of telling the story, I'd like you to draw it for me. Draw the story, and here's the catch, with your non-dominant hand. <laughs> so it's, remember a story, draw that story using the wrong hand. So go for it. We've got about three minutes, because we're short of time, so... Okay, I'm sure that's good enough. So now I'm going to ask you to go back to a more common medium, which is words, to tell a story. Um, you find three boxes at the bottom of the page. First task is try to distill your story into a single word concept. Inspiration, mentorship, failure, whatever. What was your story about in one word? What's it about in one word? Uh, you can... You may now revert to your dominant hand uh, for the rest of the morning, as far as I know. Yeah. And then in the second box, and this, you know, don't think about it for too long, this is kind of gut-level feeling. Um, why did it have such an impact on you? Just in a few notes, not an essay, just a few notes. Why did it have such an impact on you? And then in the third box, so what? So what for schools? What should we as educators or, or as parents of kids in, the, in, in schools, what, what should we remember from your story? What's the, what's the kind of embedded principle in that? So what? what? What should we learn from your story? I'm absolutely convinced that schools have something to learn from every story in the room. So what do we learn from your story? We should remember that. What's the, what's the, um, what's the takeaway? What's the learning takeaway from your story? <coughs> Okay, we'll have to s move on to the next piece of this. This is the kind of compressed version of this uh, work. Uh, to give you a chance to stop listening to me and to stand up and move around and get going for the morning, um, please, uh, please stand up, clutching your story. Bring your story with you. Uh, form trios and tr try to find parents you don't normally chat with. Try to find strangers and form trios. <laughs> and share your stories. <laughs> So just, um, just as a quick aside, you, you'll notice, how amazing is this? You would rather talk to each other than listen to me. Um, there's, there's a principle in there somewhere. Uh, a good thing to remember, Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind, as a species, we are programmed to remember stories, not facts. We're the storytelling species, how we evolved. So stories are very, very powerful. My, my colleague uh, back in my old school would say, everybody wants to know the story of a school and their place in that story. So what I think is every one of your stories had a learning principle embedded in it. So aided by my old friend Cindy, we, we, we go back years to developing the PYP together. Um, I'd like some brave soul to share a story and we're gonna collectively see the principle in your story. So anybody. Anybody? Anybody feeling courageous on it? What day is it? Is this a Thursday or a Friday? Friday. Friday. Must be Prague, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, Lisa. Okay. What's your story? All right, I was in third or fourth grade, and uh, I was studying <coughs> math, and all the kids were still working on it. And so the teacher gave me some extra work and showed me how to do some percentages. And then after I did it, I came up to her, and she said, 
You know, you are, she was really happy. You know, you are the only one in that grocery store that is going to know how much that really costs with the sale and with the percent off. And I just felt like a million bucks because she was, I could tell from her heart that she was so happy for me and she showed me how to uh, use it in real life. Thank you. All right, I'm going to pull three principles from your story because it was a very rich story. One is the principle that learning is personal. I do a lot of this work with kids. It makes all the difference in the world if the kid feels that the teacher knows them as a person. So she knew you personally. Another is, and this is to do with the learning cultures we create, learning needs to have a purpose for kids. They need to know why they're learning. Um, and we all, another one that we all know from the heart, by definition. Learning is not just a cognitive experience, it's an emotional experience. You know, I felt devastated when I was told I was too dumb to do history. You felt elated because somebody told you you were great at something. You know, it's an emotional experience. I'll actually add a, first, a fourth one, looking to the future of your story. Learning happens best in rich, relevant contexts. Because you could begin to, even if it was just imaginary, contextualize your learning into the shopping experience, it makes more sense to you. So learning's personal, learning needs to have a clear purpose expressed to the kids. It's an emotional experience. It matters to us when we learn. We, get a, we actually get a chemical buzz when we get something right. That's what, that's what video gamers understand. That's why they're so successful. And learning happens best in rich, relevant context. You, you could contextualize that. Okay, now I can see how to transfer classroom learning into real-world learning. So that's just a very, very brief example of a set of principles, and you can see those in operation in every classroom. Remember, teachers, learning is very personal to kids. It's a very emotional experience for them. You've got to put them in rich, relevant context, and you've got to make the purposes clear of learning. Otherwise, you're not going to optimize the learning opportunities for every kid. So that's just a brief taste of the kinds of things we talk about when we talk about principles. For those of you who are interested, not for now, but on the back is a set of principles that we use in schools. In, in uh, Greg's new book, uh, Leading Modern Learning with Jay McTighe, they have a very similar set of principles that they developed completely separately from us, convergent evolution. So I guess my parting uh, remark is that schools guided by principles are more effective than schools dominated by rules. I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Greg for the next stage of this. He's going to look at kind of the other end of principles. And uh, if you're right, I mean, what we've seen around the world is that principles we derive from our experiences are very common. Regardless of culture, regardless of, uh, uh, of where we went to school, whether it was an international school, a private school, or so on, or a public school, we find that the principles are very similar. So there's something uh, very rich in that. There's something very universal in those principles. Um, and there's something very strong in having a set of principles that use common language that we can help to understand the ways in which we and our kids learn best. So principles are really uh, very important and they're really at the, at the heart of what we do with the, uh, uh, with the New England uh, Association uh, accreditation process, what we're, we're going to talk about in a second. And what we do is we combine, you know, Kevin's great example of, of principles and the use of principles to help us to understand what good learning is and what it looks like with a very simple, really, uh, a premise. And that is learning and our mission statements are rarely about the simple things. Right? They're rarely about um, um, marks only. They're rarely about those, those things that are easily quantifiable. Our mission statements are full of transformational statements. Right? So schools want kids to become a global citizen or a responsible citizen or uh, 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 tolerant and, and understanding of other cultures. Whatever that may mean, uh, they're all very transformational in nature. And that means they're very difficult for us to put into action in some ways. So this is a very simple model it would say, okay, every school has a mission, vision, every organization, in, in essence, has one of those. At the heart of that are a set of definable desired impacts. Now, Kevin used the word impact a, a few times in, in, uh, uh, in, his, in his presentation, and we tend to think of impacts as being effects, right? So it had an impact on our kids. In this sense, impacts are the transformational goals we seek for students that are at the heart of our mission and vision and our aspirations for learning. Okay, they're the big goals 
underneath our mission, but they're very concrete in the sense that they're things that we can observe. Okay, so missions have, have our language that tell a story that engages us and, 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 and uh, um, connects us with the aspirations of the school, but they're often in language that is, is uh, uh, aspirational uh, and not so intentional. And so with impacts, what we try to do is we try to get those down to what are the observable things. So we want our kids to be self-directed learners because we know in the future they're going to need to be because they have to, will have to reinvent themselves several time in their, times in their lives as jobs change, as industries change, as the future uh, and the world around us change drastically and, and quickly. And so self-directed learning, though, is made up of several distinct skills and dispositions. Reflection, goal setting, uh, the ability to adapt our learning to new conditions, the ability to be self-initiated in our learning. Very concrete things that we can now use to build into our curriculum and also look for evidence. So when we have a combination of, of, of powerful principles and a language to talk about what learning should look like, and we have a set of very concrete and identifiable and observable impacts that tell us what this is designed to achieve and what our missions look like, um, uh, we have a set of impacts that we can actually capture. And that's at the heart of the, the work we're doing with, with uh, the New England Association and the accreditation protocol for ACE, is that we really want to help schools look at these things. In past uh, accreditation and what we've looked at at schools has been about looking at outputs, often outputs. So what do you have? What are the, what are the, what are the programs you have? Uh, you have a one-to-one -one laptop program, you've got these facilities, you've got this, you've got that. All important things, but in and of themselves, they don't equate to success at achieving mission through evidence of achieving impacts. Okay, so for most businesses, this is where we live, right? We have inputs, we have the resources, the, the personnel, the marketing budget, whatever it might be. And out of those come outputs, which are sales. We can easily measure the correlation between our inputs and our outputs and our success sort of lives here. In social organizations like hospitals and like schools, our goals are a little more aspirational, as I say, a little more transformational in nature. And they need to be made into things that, that we, can, we can observe and things that we can understand. And again, part of a common language to talk about learning. This is how we talk about the, the process of learning, and this is how we talk about the goals of learning. So that we can be clear about those. Alongside our academic goals are also our goals to create self-directed learners, to create creative thinkers, to help students to develop into global citizens, those sorts of things in very concrete ways. And so our belief is that by helping schools to focus on evidence of impact, it actually has a, a backwards effect on schools and helping to align their systems and how they work with the desire to have students demonstrate those on a regular basis. And so we talk about this process as being a backwards design, so from our mission to what it means, what it looks like, to the ways in which we believe we can achieve that, and then we implement forwards on, on this way. And so whenever I go to a school and we look at a mission, and they're all, they're all very well-intentioned and they're all great, and, and this school has a, has a particularly uh, eloquent and compelling mission uh, and, and, and simplified in the way that it, it talks about things. But we always ask, what does that look like and how do you know? Okay, and so the impacts help us to answer that, what does it look like? Because these are observable things that we can, we can build into our processes. And then the collection of that evidence on an ongoing basis as part of the regular uh, uh, job of doing school and learning is our how do we know. And so between the, the principles and the impacts, we believe we can cut through some of the rule-based or structure-based things that schools have always been designed around, leave room for uh, innovation in the hows, in the how this is done, in the how these are achieved, and flexibility at that level, while still having long-term goals for learning based on lasting universal ideas about what learning should look like. And the combination of the two of those gives us both that stability and that flexibility to adjust the hows as uh, new opportunities arise, as our understanding of learning changes, uh, as uh, the world around us changes and, uh, and our demographics change or whatever that might be. So I guess the simple point really that I want, want to make is that what we tried to do is to shift away from thinking about the outputs of schools, the documentation, the program, the curriculum, um, that they're important and they have to be there, but to focus really on what's important is what does it look like, how do you know, and how are you acting on your beliefs about learning in order to achieve those? 
Okay? And that's just a very simple way, and I think it's a segue between you know, Kevin's powerful uh, uh, notions about principles, which are at the core of, of, of the accreditation process that we're here to, to uh, trial, and then the notion of impacts as being the ways in which we see these lived out uh, in relation to achievement of mission, which is difficult for schools, as I say, as social enterprises. It's not so cut and dried as, as uh, uh, KFC or something like that. But. Um, and now, hopefully that will segue into, into Peter's discussion about really what we're here to do and what the uh, ACE accreditation protocol is designed to, to help schools to achieve through a different way of looking at how we help schools to achieve a level of quality, achieve mission, and focus their, their efforts on real, tangible, and important learning goals for kids. So, Peter? Thank you, Greg. <laughs> So, I want to tell you a little learning story also, those of you who are part of the staff, you heard it already from me, because my own thinking about accreditation and schools in particular was framed significantly by my son's experience. He went to my school. I, as you heard, I was the director of the Zurich International School for 25 years, and he went through that school from preschool all the way through grade 12. He is an extraordinarily bright young man who will score in the 99th percentile on any standardized test. He wrote a novel when he was 12, mm -hmm. and his grades in school were C's and D's. <clears throat> and at the end, he didn't do the full IB diploma, he, got, he did APs and he did um, IB certificates. He got his final English grade, for example, was a B minus. And I asked him, Steph, what's going on? <laughs> I don't understand that. And his answer has left a sort of lasting mark on me. It's a very simple one. He said, Dad, I have been bored for a long time. <laughs> and that was exactly the experience. And my guess is that his experience is not the only one. He's not the only one to have had an experience like this. And so this actually sort of pushed me in the back of my mind, having worked with colleagues like Kevin and many others for a long time thinking about schools. That is sort of what pushed me over the edge and made me think maybe there is something else we need to do. So you've already been pushed out a little bit this morning out of the comfort zone by having to do something with your non-dominant hand and, and draw it on top of it. Both when I did that with Kevin scared me. Scared, I was scared out of my wits because I, I'm not a very good drawer and doing it with the wrong hand made things much worse. But we need to be pulled out of our comfort zone. And one of the things we want to do is to change schools. And the premise that we have, and you may have heard it from lots of other people, is that the model of schools that we have and have had for 150, 200 years or longer is a factory model. <coughs> it was designed actually to achieve mass literacy and follow the principles on how factories operate. Everything goes through the same process, does the same things, quality check at the end is marked and is either cast out or passed on as quality, but certainly none of it was personalized learning. The idea was everybody comes out more or less looking, at the, sa looking the same, doing it in the same pace, in the same sequence of events with no big variation. It served the purpose of creating mass literacy, whether it also served the purpose of creating the kinds of individuals and young people that we need particularly now to deal with a very messy, very unpredictable kind of world where they don't even know what they're going to do when they leave school because as we hear and as we're being told all the time, the jobs they're going to take on haven't been created or many of those jobs don't exist yet and some of the jobs that they think they might be taking on in the future will not exist because of all the changes. So the premise number one is schools need to change. Some people say that if they don't change, they will become obsolete or redundant. The second premise has to do with accreditation. And you've already heard it. Accreditation, the way it has been done for also many years is, even though it there's actually a statement that it isn't, but if you look at it very closely, it is very much compliance oriented. It's a series of check boxes and hoops you have to jump through to tell us that you have all the systems, the policies, the handbooks, the facilities, and whatnot and processes in place. 
and then you get accredited. And the question that we are asking now is, do we want to improve schools or do we want to transform schools? What's the difference? Improving, in my definition, means you will do better what you have always done, but you're still in the same box. You're redecorating the box. Transforming means you have to get out of your comfort zone and maybe look at what you have been doing from a very different perspective if you want to change schools significantly. We all know that education is one of the slowest elephants <laughs> to move lumber forward. Education has not changed very much yet. We have more modern facilities, we, we, we have some technology, but the interaction between teacher and student has not changed significantly if you look at it very closely. So these two premises, and I would go so far as to say, you know the book by Jim Collins, From Good to Great, and he says, good is the enemy of great. I'm willing to say that improvement is the enemy of innovation because it doesn't get you out of that box. You stay in the box, you do the same thing, you continue to do the same thing. So our answer is ACE. And I want to run a short little video that we did which sort of summarizes what it's all about and go a little bit more into detail. What is ACE? And why are we introducing a fundamentally different accreditation model when previous versions have worked quite well? Well, it all depends on what you believe the value add of accreditation for schools should be. If you want your school to simply improve, a traditional accreditation model will serve the purpose well enough. But if you want to transform your school, then ACE Learning is for you. ACE is learning architecture, learning culture and learning ecology. It is built on five gatekeeper foundation standards which ensure a safe, secure, sustainable and healthy environment for all. Once the foundation is secure, ACE defines a coherent, systemic approach to transformational learning, driven and shaped by ten learning principles. ACE aims to transform schools into communities that share and act upon a common, explicit understanding of learning. It does so by focusing on learning impacts rather than simply on traditional organisational outputs. Learning impacts are the community's highest goals and require it to look for evidence both within a student's learning experience and in the products of that student's learning. ACE doesn't assess schools based on whether or not they meet traditional standards. ACE is formative and understands that learning communities are at different stages of maturation and development. What matters is whether they have a conceptual understanding of learning, whether they are able to demonstrate commitment to the transformation process, whether they have the capacity to close the gap between where they are and where they want to be, and whether they have the competency to affect true change. We call these the four C's of accreditation. ACE meets schools where they are, and because rubrics for the 10 core learning principles describe a continuum of transformation, which gives access to a bank of actual representative practices, ACE Learning also serves as a portal to a global network of learning communities. Gone are mountains of paper documentation. Gone are large visiting teams combing through reams of policy documents. Gone are siloed self-study committees. Gone are one-size-fits-all accreditation cycles. And gone are dozens of standards that only focus on the status quo. The ACE Learning Ecosystem focuses a learning community's energies squarely on its core business, learning. So, if you want to transform your school, then ACE Learning is for you. Let me get a little bit deeper into this, but <clears throat> it has to be brief. Just a, a recap of what it looks like. I like the triangle, but actually the new logo is now the circles, and it works better, but it allows us to show the relationship a little better. There are really two parts to ACE. One is the f what we call the foundations, and that's this compliance-oriented part. Yes, you do need to have facilities. Yes, you do need to have a governance structure. Yes, you do need to have a written curriculum. Yes, you do have to make sure that the kids are safe, that they're provided for, and you do have to make sure you have qualified teachers and staff and administrators. That's the foundation. Without that, nothing is going to happen. But the presence of those things does not guarantee in itself that learning will take place. You can't do 
learning without foundations, but you cannot necessarily get learning just by being aligned with the foundation standards. So the heart of ACE is encapsulated in these three pieces, learning culture, learning architecture, and learning ecology. The five foundation standards, as you have seen in the movie, really address just those things that I mentioned. The learning structure, organizational structure, safety, security, and health, basically. Finance and facilities, an organization also has to be financially viable in order to provide the, <coughs> the, the, the services to the students. And the last one, climate, may not be the best term for it. That's all about are people in this organization treated fairly and equitably? <laughs> are there appeals procedures? You know, do they have contracts? Are, they, are, they <coughs> are, uh, are there systems in place that guarantee that there is a healthy morale? You need to have those. And these become the gatekeepers for us. What happens in current accreditation is that we go through all of this and spend most of our time in a team room reading documents. Hundreds of pages of policies, documentation. In the future, what will happen is the school will upload these to, the, to our website, website, and we will read those documents before a school even begins the accreditation process. And it will enable us to identify, is it a safe, a healthy, and a sustainable place? If it isn't, we don't have to go further until they've got that fixed. But then, when we come to the school, and this is what we have been doing this week, here, by the way, and I'm not going to go read through them, there are the five foundation standards, only five. The current protocol, the eighth edition, by the way, has 37 standards. Now, there are only five of these foundation standards. But what we do when we are here is to look at our learning principles, and there are 10 of them. 10 core learning principles. You saw those wheels, which are intended to promote a systems thinking approach to school. In other words, how do all of the systems that exist within a school support learning? We don't explicitly mention a mission statement. And I've been asked about that. Why aren't you, why isn't there something that actually mentions the mission statement? Well, the mission statement, as far as we're concerned, is the school's definition of learning. That's what matters most. And once the school has established that common language about learning, they will be able to deal with these learning principles. You notice every single one has the word learning in them. Once again, I don't want to read the actual definition of them, simply to point out these are exactly the principles that Kevin was talking about that matters. It's principles, not rules. The other difference that results from that is that we're not looking to see are you passing or failing. Current accreditation model is pass-fail. There are one, two, three, four criteria. If you get a one and a two, you fail. If you get a three and a four, you pass. We understand just like students, just like our learners, schools are in different places, in a different places of times of maturation and at different points with regard to all of these. And what matters, therefore, is whether they have a clear path forward, whether they know where they're going. And as you heard from Greg, one of the key pieces in it is to move away from outputs having programs in place, doing lots of neat things, to figuring out what is the impact on the learner. And you notice that all of those, that's just a sample from Learning Principle 5, learners demonstrate. Is, this is the observable part. That's actually the biggest challenge to the school, to provide evidence that students, learners, are doing these things. What is the evidence that will support that? And only then will you know whether you have had the impact. So school may have all sorts of programs in place, but actually those programs don't necessarily achieve any of the learning, learning goals. And some schools, as, as Greg said, very often think because they have all of those things in place, good things happen. Similarly, when we do teacher appraisal, for example, many schools when they do teacher appraisal, they focus on the teacher. I think. If the teacher does all of those things, the kids will learn. Wrong, again. You need to focus on what the students, the learners are doing in class 
not necessarily on what the teacher does, because ultimately it's only what they do that matters more. And the question is, does, is what the teacher is doing in the class facilitating the learning of the students? So the impacts, foundation standards, 10 straightforward learning principles based on impact, and these are very broadly defined. We ask the school and encourage the school to define their own impacts that they want, but they have to be framed in terms of observable evidence that can be, can be added to make sure that the, 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 the schools or the students, the learners, actually show that, that the learning they have done has had this impact. And then you've, heard that you've seen the continuum. Thinking about it, working on it, living it, what if. That replaces the fails or does not meet the standard, meets the standard. We believe that schools, there's actually another one that I haven't put up here and it says not yet evident. Those are schools that are not very mature yet. They don't have, they don't show evidence yet that they, that they are aligned with the learning principles. But most of them will be somewhere in here within these three categories, thinking about it, working on it, and living it, we provide very descriptive rubrics. And actually one step further that we are planning, and that will only come with time, is that behind the rubrics, we will actually put representative examples of actual practice from schools. And that's what's meant in the video that you have seen about connecting schools to a worldwide net because schools will be able to go <laughs> into this protocol, click on a particular learning principle, and see, okay, what does that look like? What, is it, what does it actually look like? What have schools actually done when they are working on it or living it? And they'll see the concrete examples of it. That's a bank that will grow and it will be accessible to all, all schools in the process. The what if is the transformation piece. We don't define it. That is really the leap schools can make if they have come up to this point. What would it take? What could we do to flip the paradigm altogether having come this far? And that's open. We don't define that because we don't actually know what that might look like. But it is an encouragement to schools to even imagine a future further down. And now while we are on future design and imagining the future, that's what we want schools to do. And we also believe that this whole process will actually become the school's strategic or future design. <coughs> Prefer the term future design to strategic plan. What's the difference? We want the community to look forward. We want them to imagine where they want to be two, three years down the road and then plan backwards to, given where we are now, what do we have to do in order to get where we want to be? And of course, a learning community needs to think about what will drive this, and by the same token, what are some of the challenges and the obstacles we have to deal with? That's all about reasonable and sensible change management, because you cannot simply say, okay, we're going to do all of these wonderful things and forget the, for, forget the challenges, because there are, there will be challenges um, along the way. But you notice that the key, again, will be, it's not just some abstract goal, we will do these things, but what is it that our kids, our learners, uh, will be doing? So we want to change the premises for learning. We are implicit in the principles, or these questions. Where does learning happen? Does it only happen in classrooms, in the school? What does it look like? What is it? What does learning look like? And also, and that's an even bigger question, what's worth learning? There's a lot of talk out there right now that the curricula we have are not necessarily providing students with those competencies, skills, dispositions, and values, that's a direct quote from one of our learning principles, they need in order to be successful in, in this world of ours. So, five change pieces in it. The impact, the emphasis on impact, evidence that shows that the learners are able to do what the learning principles suggest, learning observation, 
We spent most of our time in the, these past two and a half days when we were here just going to classes, not meeting, uh, having lots of meetings with people, not reading documentation, being in classes, observing what is happening. <coughs> Designing, coming up with a design for the future plan, one size does not fit all, that's another change. Right now the accreditation protocols have very defined, clear sort of benchmarks along the way. The first year after, after uh, accreditation you do this, the second year you do that, five years after you do that, etc., etc. We're not going to do this. We're going to tailor what happens afterwards to the individual needs of the school. Where is the school? And we adapt it to the school's needs. And lastly, it's not about failure and success, it's about a commitment, the capacity, you heard the four C's, the conceptual understanding, the commitment, the capacity, and the, and, the, and the competence to effect change. That, in a nutshell, is what ACE is about and how ACE proposes and hopes to uh, contribute a little bit to changing schools into organisms and systems that are aligned with the needs of our times. That's a tall order and an idealistic goal, but that's exactly what we are about. Thank you. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers? Or have we dumbfounded you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Use the mic so we can pick it up on the Thank you. I just wanted to ask if the principles that you were talking about are in any way related to the principles that we have on this sheet of paper? Are they? They are related. You will see the, the words may be different. Kevin, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, the, um, we're working with, uh, I guess, three different organizations. One is the Common Ground Collaborative, where those principles came from. Like I said, Greg's group has another set. Uh, and we're, we're working closely together to bring a real alignment. Honestly, I was surprised and pleased to see that when I looked at Greg's work, it's almost exactly the same stuff. As you showed with that activity, we all actually know what good learning principles are. When you sit with a group of people, even if you start from scratch, honestly, you end up with almost the same set of ideas. What we've done is really, for the first time, align that with an accreditation process. Because in the past, people worked on curriculum, and they worked on accreditation, and never the twain shall meet. It was completely siloed. We said, we're going to take a lot of the hard work out of this. We'll do the hard work of aligning, thinking about learning. We're thinking about improving learning in schools. So while they may not be verbatim, the same team put those ones together. So they're very closely aligned. Yes, I should say that both Kevin and Greg are part of the ACE design team <laughs> with me. You were talking about learning is personal, one of the principles, and later on the, in the presentation you were uh, talking about uh, one size doesn't fit all, uh, maybe in the high level of school, not necessarily on the, ch on the children level, but it, I guess it it's applies as well. And you also gave your child, uh, your, the experience of your own child of being bored because he was uh, of higher, I don't know, capacity or a gifted kid. Or, uh, in that light, what is your opinion, uh, your opinion, all of you, of uh, programs for gifted kids in school? I don't know if this, it's the right term. With gifted kids, I mean kids with uh, stronger ability or capacity f of learning. Yeah, I can give you the standard answer. I don't believe in, in gifted and talented programs. All children are gifted and talented. But they have gifts and talents in different areas, and what we need to do is to give the kids more voice and choice. I think those are the two terms that we've been using in what they learn and how they learn it and how they are able to demonstrate the learning. Kevin. Yeah, uh, one, one thing is good spotting. I mean, one of our principles is learning is scalable. How kids learn is how adults learn is how organizations learn. That's why one size doesn't fit all for kids or for schools. Um, this is wearing my other hat, the Common Ground Collaborative. Well, when we design learning modules, um, they're designed uh, for regrouping for kids for pers to pursue different elements of a module. We were just in Quito writing one called Feeding the Billion. Um, there are three assessment tasks, and kids can choose their level of assessment task. The higher level of assessment is kids design their own assessment task according to certain principles and criteria with the guidance of the teachers. 
If you have a curriculum that in itself offers flexibility, student voice, student choice, you don't really need separate gifted programs. I say that in total ignorance of ISP's approach, so I will not treading on any toes. But, yeah, so, but you can't just say that. You have to make sure that the learning is designed to give that choice. Otherwise, it is just one size fits all. But once you have that level of flexibility, one of our other principles is less is more. If you don't do too many of those learning modules and you become very good at teaching them and they're co-written with experts, you can also bring in community experts. Let's say it's on feeding the billion. You can bring in people from the World Food Organization, the World Health Organization, with massive expertise to work with a particular group of kids. So they may be grouped for a very challenging work within a particular module, but the next module might be about something else where they're not particularly gifted. So I guess most educators would say fixed groups of gifted kids uh, is not necessarily a good idea, but opportunities for them to work at very challenging levels with other very able students is a, is a very good thing. But we try to avoid fixed programs and we, because basically the whole program should be uh, amenable to all the kids. If the program itself is flexible, you don't really need another program. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not really, other than to say that, that, that the notion of self-directed learning or personalized learning is, is definitely one of the principles with ACE, and, and sort of my view is, is exactly the same, is, is the environment should allow for that. The, the way I put it is that our goal as schools is to, is to uh, amplify and, and extend multiple facets of all kids. Right? And, uh, and, and that means that, that we need to help them to discover those, but we need to also have programs that are flexible enough, uh, give them voice and choice, as we say, uh, um, and allow them to work in challenging, messy environments and allow them to excel in those. Um, and that, in and of itself, I think is, is challenge enough <laughs> and gives the opportunities for kids to do that, again, with, a, with, a, with the goal of amplifying and elevating multiple facets of, of all kids. Um, it's it's a, a very interesting concept. Uh, those of us who went to school uh, decades ago, um, we sort of got handed uh, one size fits everyone, as as you well know. And to make learning personal, what I was wondering about, you know, in the extreme, you could have your own personal tutor who um, manages it to the way that the person learns and makes it perfectly for that individual. What about the resource base uh, there, uh, for, for a school in order to achieve learning on a personal basis as opposed to one size fits all? One size fits all is real easy. I'm a teacher, I get up in front of a, a hundred students and I lecture and they take it however they take it. But if it becomes personal, what about the resource base and what can you say is that a much more extensive um, a resource base necessary, or how do you deal with that? Well, one of my answers would be that, that this, this is one of the areas where technology um, is providing a lot of new avenues and access, because through technology we can access resources that we have never, that a normal school would never have, and certainly in my old school I would never have. I had to deal with whatever was there. But I also remember that one of my own positive experiences was exactly when we were, actually the assignment was figure out who caused World War I. And that's my positive learning story because the teacher, we didn't actually, we, didn't, we had no clue what to do. We asked the teacher, what do you want us to do? He said, for you to figure out. We, I want you to, to figure out how you're, going to, how you're going to establish who caused World War I. And initially what we did, we went to the library and then found, nah, well, we didn't like the books that were there. And then we started going outside. We went to embassies. We went to the Soviet embassy <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to hear what they had to say. Well, and then we went to, the, to, to, we went to, the German, to some German collections and figure out all those different ones. So we had to do all of this physically. Kids now, through technology, actually have access to a lot more resources, a lot more information, a lot more... Uh, uh, materials that they can work with and that the challenge for, the, for that will be that they know and that's another piece that needs that we need to improve and work on is that they know what how to evaluate what they look at and what they work with. Kevin. Yeah I, just to say I think you nailed one of the great challenges for school leaders and managers these days which is realigning resources with that new vision. Um, some of the work we've been doing is um, 
offering a very simple uh, curricular framework. That means you don't necessarily need uh, curriculum coordinators because the cream's already coordinated. I think the biggest um, lack in schools, and this again is late career aha moment, is coaching. Because what we've realized is um, that in order for the kids and adults to learn new skills, you can't just give people input. It's the same in industry. You, uh, my last evaluation at ISB was with the board chair and the vice chair. The vice chair was head of R&D in Procter & Gamble. And I talked about the failure of professional development events to change teachers' practice and the realization that unless you follow it up with sustained coaching, people don't change their practice. And, and David Cummings from Procter & Gamble said to me, oh, we worked that out years ago. He said, our model is, is how, how we spend our money. 10% new input, 30% coaching, 60% practicing. But schools generally will send teachers to, to professional development. And we spent, oh God knows, I don't know how many millions we spent at ISB on PD. And then you wonder why it's not having a major impact. Unless someone coaches you in a new practice, we're all the same. You just go, Monday morning you do what you always did. So where will the money come from coaching? Well, maybe fewer curriculum coordinators. What we have to do, and it's not easy, is you've still got the same budget. You can't say, new approaches to learning, double the fees. Not, not unless you want, to, if you want to get out of a room like this alive. Um, <laughs> So you have to say, we've got this many resources, right, we'll do, f we'll do less is more, we'll do fewer modules, we'll have fewer coordinators, we'll have more coaches. But it really is sitting down and saying, what are the biggest learning impacts we're looking for? If we could only do one or two things, which things would have the most positive impact on learning for the most kids? Right, we'll do those things, okay. Then we'll align our resources with those things. Some things we'll stop doing. I mean, uh, Peter mentioned the Good to Great book by Jim Collins. He said the great companies, the stop doing list became longer than the to-do list. When they identified what they could be best in the world at, their stop doing list became longer than their to-do list because we only have limited resources. What ACE is helping schools do is determine which will be the big impact items, focus on those things. If other things go by the wayside, honestly, so much the better. Let's make life simpler. But we, we just have to spend the money to get the biggest impact. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Kevin said, what schools have been doing with accreditation until now is that they'll end up with 100 recommendations to themselves of all those things that they will do. And strategic plans that may be 20 pages long that have 200 actions in it. And actually nothing happens. <laughs> what we want to, schools to do, and you will experience that when you go through the internal reflection process that follows now, is that in the end we want you to narrow it down to two, three, maybe four major learning goals that, as Kevin said, will have the greatest impact on learning in the school. And that's what you concentrate on and do not fritter away your money and time on 50 zillion other things, yeah, that sure we could do, but that are, that are maybe low hanging and easy fruit, but that don't, will not get you to where you want to be. Are no. there any collection or any <laughs> sharing uh, of your principles and the uh, way of thinking? Very simple answer. I will answer it. N-O. <laughs> no. I don't think they are. Uh, universities, not only in uh, creating the kinds of teachers that we want, although I believe actually all teachers are capable of buying into this model when they reflect on it and work on it and have the coaching that uh, Kevin uh, referred to. But quite aside from that, I actually believe uh, that's another topic, that universities themselves, the whole university model, will come under increasing pressure because universities aren't producing <laughs> uh, the kinds of kids uh, you know, that are coming to them. We had something uh, kind of funny in our organization. We were asked by our CEO, each, there are four accrediting uh, commissions in our school, public schools, independent schools, international schools, and then, the, and then the universities. We accredit all of the universities in New England. So we were asked to demonstrate how the accreditation protocols prepares students for college. That was the, makes sure that they're college ready. And I said, actually, I would, I understand where you're going with this, but I think the question that needs to be asked is, are the colleges and universities ready <laughs> 
for the kinds of students and young people they're going to get that are not prepared necessarily to do what the universities do today because they also realize that they're not equipping them with the kinds of skills and abilities and competencies that they need. You know, why is Google telling people that they're hiring fewer and fewer college graduates? Because they don't, they don't have what it takes. That's their answer. It's a circle. It's like a circle. Yeah. And one more myth that I, because what we often hear is, um, we can't do all of these things because the universities are expecting the kids to come out with all of this other stuff and they won't get into college. I actually think that that's a myth that needs to be busted. <coughs> there is, of course, a core of knowledge the kids need to have. But I think beneath that, this model allows the kids also to develop those skills and competencies they need to have, not to be successful <laughs> at the university only, but to become successful citizens in, in our world. So I think the answer, oh, we can't do it because the universities are there and telling us what to do, um, I, don't, I don't buy it any longer. I know there are more questions, and I'll urge you to continue the conversation after we break up. Hopefully you can stay around for a little while. They, they actually have some other work to do while they're here. Um, but I want to thank our three speakers, uh, and I want to comment on some of the, the questions that were asked and some of the comments that were made, starting with the last one about this issue about university admissions. As parents, there's always a concern, rightfully so, will my child get into the right university? What the right university is is another question. We won't go into that now. Uh, and obviously, we want to make sure that that happens when you graduate from ISP, and we believe it does. But there's so much more that we have to be paying attention to if you want kids to be successful in life. And that's what this is all about. Um, what's really exciting to me is that when we are trying to innovate and change, as ISP does, and continues on that continuum, we need partnerships with parents, which is one of the reasons we do the Edge in Education. We, and with kids and with everyone in our community, this is not something we can do without you or around you or behind your back. You need to be part of the conversation and part of the process. We need to have a culture of innovation in order to change. And I believe those are one of the foundational pieces that are necessary to change. You can't simply say, uh, here's how you're going to do it or do these things and you will change. There needs to be a, a sense within the community, a climate, a culture, a belief system within the community about where the school is going and a big part of that is the mission of the school which is so widely discussed and disseminated. But we need partners outside of the school. We talk about, uh, and school leaders often blame university admissions for not doing certain things. We won't do that. We can't transform in that way because that will mean that our students won't be able to get into a university. As uh, Peter said, firstly, that's not really true uh, anymore. And secondly, that's not a really good excuse for not giving kids what they need to be successful in life. So we wholeheartedly uh, believe in these learning principles and are excited to uh, engage with them. Next year, the whole community will be involved with this. It's not just the leadership team or teachers. It's going to be parents and kids and staff involved in this. There will be different uh, committees set up uh, which will be looking at different learning principles in different areas of the schools. This is going to be a community effort, and I, will, I believe it will help propel the school forward in the direction that we want to go in. So in conclusion, I want to thank our courageous leaders uh, from outside of ISP for bringing uh, these ideas to us and helping us move in the direction that we think is so important. Thank you. Thank you.